In an ongoing effort to inform citizens about issues of vital public importance, the Bureau of Governmental Research presents an interview with LaToya Cantrell, candidate for mayor of New Orleans, conducted by BGR's president and CEO, Amy Glavinsky. Thanks for joining us today. As you may know, BGR is a nonpartisan nonprofit. We've been in the community for about 85 years, and our primary public service is independent research and analysis and furtherance of informed public policy making and the effective use of public resources. In essence, we work for the improvement of local government. And as you know, in September, we initiated the BGR candidate Q&A series. Um, and our first installment in that series was the questions for a new mayor, which you participated in. As part of that series, we issued a number of questions on critical issues in the community, asked for written responses, and then published those responses in reports on our website. And we did the same thing for city council candidates. So with a runoff election on the horizon, November 18th, we've asked you to come here today to continue the conversation that we started in our candidate Q&A report. First up today is public safety. And we noticed in your written responses that you um, you mentioned specifically that you would consider increased funding for the NOPD and you named three priority issues, retention, the crime lab, and the homicide division. But you noted that you would first look at existing unallocated resources before seeking additional revenue. So I would like to understand um, the sort of the nature of the unallocated revenue that you've identified, how you found it, and to what extent you think it could meet these needs. The nature of the uh, unidentified resources that uh, you are referring to were resources that I found in uh, the uh, business management line item uh, within the New Orleans Police Department's budget, uh, which was therefore not only identified, but um, identified as a potential funding source for increased uh, pay raises for police officers. Uh, at the last uh, New Orleans City Council meeting, uh, I voted along with my colleagues to ensure that uh, the revenue for pay increases were approved that would allow for that increase to happen January of 2018. In reference to the New Orleans Police Department's budget overall, uh, which makes up about 65% of the current general fund budget, uh, I am of the belief that uh, the New Orleans Police Department at this level uh, is funded properly. Uh, there are, um, there is a need to reassess uh, the uh, initiatives that have been implemented, uh, growth um, in terms of, 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 of leadership, in terms of um, looking at the homicide division, looking at the crime lab, of course, continuing to focus on recruitment as well as retention. By May of 2018, uh, we're very hopeful that the city uh, will be from underneath the consent decree mm -hmm. as it is aligned with NOPD. Uh, and so with that, it allows greater flexibility for the city uh, to uh, reallocate those resources, mm -hmm. then we can have more um, academy classes. We're not just locked in to a couple of a year. Do I understand correctly, though, that um, that you believe this can be accomplished without additional revenue? At this stage of the game, yes, ma'am. Prior to allocating additional resources, I believe that there's a, a, a necessary step, first step, to reassess. Uh, the existing conditions within the New Orleans Police Department, reassess initiatives that have been implemented to determine you know, how well we're doing, measure our effectiveness, um, look at areas that we need to strengthen, and therefore with those reassessments it should uh, allow us with, uh, you know, with greater uh, knowledge as to how we not only can improve but also uh, to what extent we need to increase uh, funding. Mm -hmm. You mentioned to us on the topic of, uh, of the potential need to increase the funding, that much of the future needs of the police department can be funded through natural growth of the general fund. I'm interested to understand what you specifically have in mind when you mention natural growth, um, how much annual revenue you project from that natural growth and what the sources are. Sure, natural growth is looking at the pattern of the budget and revenue, um, basically that changes from year to year. 
uh, based on tax increases, meaning more, re more development coming online yields a, uh, yields a uh, greater uh, level of increase with revenue. So with projections and looking at past uh, revenue versus expenditures, on average, we grow about 27 million a year. Of course, as you get into uh, you know, your year like 2017, where we are now, uh, we're seeing projections for 2018 are not as high as we anticipated because not um, um, a lot of our residents at this particular time are not paying uh, their uh, sanitation fees. And so it's, it's, um, it's still kind of, it, it, it's a moving target. Mm -hmm. So there's a degree of uncertainty. Yes. Right. Um, when you talk about revenue growth, and you've quantified it as approximately 27 million projected annually. So what other areas do you see would require revenue growth, use of these additional funds? Oh, well, I mean, the needs are great in our city, not just in terms of public safety, uh, in terms of law enforcement, but of course with infrastructure, uh, infrastructure improvements that are aligned with the sewage and water board that we know our priority, but also looking at the Department of Public Works, not uh, really looking at them separately when we talk about the capacity that needs to improve align with infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are some areas uh, that will need great focus in addition uh, to just our overall uh, municipal employees uh, who have not received a raise in over nine years mm -hmm. uh, more, where morale is low. You have stated that NOPD officers should be paid enough to make off-duty details unnecessary, or at least the media has reported. Um, and I'm curious as to whether you can shed some light on what that means in terms of dollars, sort of what's the goal there to make off-duty details unnecessary? Well, the, the thought there, not so much um, unnecessary that it has to be built in to their monthly income to take care of their families. Officers should not have to say or, or have to work a detail in order to make ends meet. To supplement their income, of course, to reach some of their own financial goals, yes. But just to make ends meet, uh, I think that that is um, burdensome. Uh, so one, it is more about uh, giving our officers an increase in pay which I have just done with my colleagues, and not just in terms of retention, but also in terms of recruitment. On police chief accountability, you have stated that you want the police chief to have both autonomy and accountability. Um, can you explain for us the effective method for imposing accountability on an autonomous police chief? Sure, well, that, that's tied to your contract. Uh, much like we did um, during uh, the Morial administration when Chief Pennington uh, was hired. Uh, it was built into his contract. Uh, performance measures, accountability measures, uh, reducing crime by a certain percentage, having real goals tied to the contract uh, that are aligned with performance. And based on that, uh, the chief was held accountable uh, to reducing crime, and crime was cut in half by 50%. Um, having a chief in place that has the latitude and, of course, the authority and the autonomy to do his or her job has to happen uh, in order to have a healthy department, in order to have real accountability. Uh, the top down just really doesn't work. And uh, I'm going to be mayor. I'm not going to be the chief of police, but we will hire the best chief for the city of New Orleans to ensure public safety, uh, crime reduction, uh, neighborhood policing strategies that are real, building community, uh, building trust, meeting our people where they are, stabilizing neighborhoods and environments, wraparound services for our people, mental health services, substance abuse services, getting the trash out of our people's eyes in terms of the, the neighborhoods that they live in, uh, implementing a technology that I fought for in terms of license plate readers, crime cameras, with all of these things in place, working simultaneously, then we will reduce crime in our city, but we will build up the built environment so that our people not only feel safe, but they're living in an environment where their quality of life protects them from any violent crime. 
you have mentioned that that we need metrics that more directly correlate to crime and violence reduction. And I would like to understand how you would improve the performance measures that have been in place under the current administration on the issue of public safety and the NOPD. There really hasn't, hasn't been any uh, metrics in place in terms of, of, of real goal setting about, you know, in the next year we're going to reduce crime by 5%, 10%. There are no um, goals uh, built into the contract with our current chief. Um, I, so I would look to do that, implement that. Uh, I would look uh, to performance measures as it relates to uh, programming uh, tied to uh, Nord Sea, for example, uh, where we stop with recreation as it relates to, uh, you know, the ages 16 to 24, when we know those are critical uh, periods of our young people within our city. But not only that, we know uh, that, that that crime is kind of centered around uh, those ages as well. Um, connecting our youth to real growth opportunities. I think those have to be built in as well. And goals again in terms of how are we uh, working to stabilize neighborhoods. But what I would like to focus on as you mentioned with violent crime is really expanding the Tiger uh, team that was put in place recently by the New Orleans Police Department with them, you know, taking, you know, really a tactical, you know, in, intelligence, building that unit where they're laser focused on who's committing the crimes, where the crimes are occurring, so that it really prevents us from making everybody in, in a community feel unsafe as if everybody in the community um, are the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. It prevents us from doing that. It makes us be able to really focus on where it's occurring, who the criminals are and targeting them. Um, this was put in place when the rash of armed uh, robberies were happening throughout the city of New Orleans. And as a result, we've seen a downtick. And so with our ability to expand this program, I believe that it will get us where we want to be. TIGER is an acronym. Right? Yes, it can, is. Can you tell me what that's It's um, the Tactical uh, Intelligence Unit. You've said accountability starts at the top and under the framework that you envision, um, how accountable should the mayor be for policing outcomes and public safety? Well, the mayor is ultimately accountable for public safety. And uh, it would be my job to ensure that we have the most effective leadership in place, not just with the, the police department, but with departments and agencies throughout uh, the city of New Orleans that are under uh, the authority of the mayor. And I accept that responsibility. Mm -hmm. I recall that you mentioned that you would not maintain the deputy mayor system. How would you organize your executive staff to ensure accountability and sort of um, um, excellent performance and, and execution? I don't believe that the deputy mayors get us there. I think uh, the structure is not what it does. It's the individuals who are placed in positions of authority uh, and holding them accountable. Uh, I believe in the chief administrative office. Uh, officer having one, definitely a chief of staff, uh, and of course department heads. And I am a huge supporter of building up a middle management, mm -hmm. um, building up those who keep government running regardless of who the mayor is, regardless of who the New Orleans City Council is. And with effective leadership and overall management, then we will yield greater results for citizens of this city. I know that you have mentioned that better training for city employees on the issue of best practices is, um, is something that you envision occurring under your leadership. Can you t just tell us a little bit more about what that program would consist of? What citizens should expect from it in terms of the delivery of city services? Well, when you invest in the people that you are uh, expecting to deliver results, then you get things done. Uh, when morale is low, and um, you don't invest in them, mm -hmm. then it also shows. So the level of service, uh, customer service, uh, the, um, the uh, level of really change in the culture within city, within city government from one of no, uh, trying to figure out every reason why we can't do something, to changing it around to let's figure out every reason why we can get something done. Uh, building up the morale is very important, uh, and you do that by investing in people. You do that by improving their skill sets. You do that 
uh, by giving them the uh, access to best practices that are working in other municipalities. We haven't invested in our people. There is no line item within civil service for professional development. They're yearning for professional development. They're learning for best practices. Who would the instructors be? So what would your program look like? Well, the program will look like, one, playing to our strengths in a city that has eight colleges and universities and two medical schools, mm -hmm. uh, building in a real relationship and partnership with our higher ed community, uh, not overlooking Delgado, which I consider our higher ed community as well. This is not cookie cutter, mm -hmm. so I can't rattle off to you uh, exactly what components would be built into that level of professional development because it has to come from the people. It has to come from those who are doing the job every single day. I've met with Tulane. I've met with UNO. I've met with Delgado. This is something that they're interested in. So you mentioned support for continued implementation of the 2014 civil service rules mm -hmm. changes. Um, you know, we are a few years beyond that reform effort, and there are still profound complaints about civil service, both from employees and um, sort of from, from managers. You mentioned flexibility and more efficient hiring practices. I would like to understand from you how you intend to act in furtherance of the goals of that reform, and what are the obstacles that have kept us from achieving them? Well, the goals of, of that reform uh, have been, one, uh, issues that the um, civil servants or the leadership have put forth of themselves. Uh, one, paying more you know, into uh, their insurance, into NOMERS. Uh, they agreed to that uh, and that moved forward, uh, which NOMERS is a pretty healthy, uh, it's, it's very healthy, actually. When you say healthy, you mean the funded ratio of yes. NOMERS? So, I am committed to additional uh, reforms, again, that the employees are in agreement with. So the time being vested, moving from five to 10, they are supportive of that, um, and, and I am too. Uh, but what I would like to see prior to uh, any other changes uh, would be that we focus on, one, the employees have, that have already made these reforms and bought into them, but they have yet to receive a, an increase in salary or in wages in nine years. So in order to you know, really implement effective reforms and still get uh, the, the output that we're looking for from our people, we have to invest in our people. And so for me, it really does speak to implementing, uh, one, receiving uh, this compensation study that's being conducted right now that is expected to be, to be completed uh, within the next few weeks, uh, using that uh, and, as, and really implementing some of the recommendations aligned with that study um, so that one, we can do both. It's not an and or, we can do both and. And that means moving forward with additional reforms, but at the same time, building up our people, giving them the increases uh, that are aligned with that compensation study. When you're talking about the reforms that you support, uh, what is your reference point or benchmark for determining sort of what elements or components or features of the plan need to be reformed? Well, it really comes from, again, being collaborative, listening, mm -hmm. listening to uh, those who are civil servants who are actually in the role. And through this level of collaboration, again, being able to meet, meet in the middle. And I think that that's coming uh, forth. But it can't be top down, mm -hmm. and especially in an environment where the morale is low and pay hasn't been uh, increased in nine years. Do you attribute the low morale to solely the pay issue, or are there other factors? No, I contribute the low morale to not investing in your people, not having professional development, not looking at them as professional individuals. Uh, again, top down. Uh, there's something to be said when you do not engage uh, the people that you expect to hold accountable or provide them with professional development or listening you know, to the changes that they would like to see or having, allowing them to have input as to how they can further advance the growth of the department that yields greater results to our, to our people. You know, they're doing the job, they matter. So when you look at folks top down, you lose something. And when you lose momentum, then our people suffer because of that, meaning the citizens of the city. You don't get the service, quality service that you're looking for.
You mentioned um, earlier in our conversation the need for a cultural shift at City Hall. These things that you just described to me, is that, is that um, what you have in mind in terms of the sort of how you achieve a cultural shift? Because that's not an easy thing to do. No, it's not. A cultural shift isn't easy. Uh, but when you do show people, one, that you, you really do care about them, mm -hmm. that you really do understand that not having uh, an increase in salary, no mention of it, no talk about it in nine years, uh, when we have been able uh, to uh, move the city in, you know, in a direction to where at least we're, we are seeing some growth and some level of growth and opportunity, yet not everyone has been connected or tied to that, mm -hmm. but having understanding that some of the folks that haven't been tied to that growth are those who work for the city of New Orleans. Right. So when you are willing to invest in the people that work for you, that's not just about a dollar, but it is about investing in them with professional development, with best practices, wanting to improve their skills, um, wanting to improve the conditions that they're working in, people feel you care about them. How does the Civil Service Department fit into your vision of this cultural shift? Are they an ally? Um, and how can we cause the goals of the reform to occur as part of this vision that you have? One, they have to be an ally. They're the backbone of city government. <laughs> regardless of who the mayor is, regardless of who the New Orleans City Council is, they're the backbone of city government. So they have to be engaged. You have to listen to them. And they should be a part of, not just reforms, but they have to be a part of the cultural shift. It's about them. So this task force that I mentioned earlier of creating with the Civil Service Department, step in the right direction something that I will build upon because it creates an environment that is mutual, mutual respect, wanting to invest in people, understanding the need for, for, for professional development. And they want it. They want it. And, um, and it's something that, that we will provide them with. Again, that will eventually change the culture within city government. On the issue of street maintenance and preventive maintenance for streets, would you commit to a um, pavement management plan, including its annual funding? We do need a maintenance fund. I think a maintenance fund has to be uh, created. That is uh, not just in terms of off the backs of those who are paying uh, property taxes right now. There has to be a structure where everyone puts some skin in the game. Um, and that also speaks to us, uh, meaning the city, being able to get and have greater flexibility uh, in regards to the taxes uh, that uh, are generated off the backs of our people here, our hospitality industry, for example, uh, but working in a collaborative effort to not put the burden on the backs of one individual nor one organization, but all of us and creating uh, that level of collaboration to where we come up with a system and a structure to where we all buy in, but we all pay in. Um, a, an, an infrastructure uh, fund is something that is necessary. You have said more than once that you'd like to redirect the hotel occupancy and sales taxes toward um, infrastructure, whether that means infrastructure fund or the general fund. Can you talk to me about your idea on that? And it's not redirect uh, all of the taxes from hospitality mm -hmm. to infrastructure, so I did not say that. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I did say uh, and what has been said previously is that the city of New Orleans needs to retain an additional level of or percentage of resources generated and created off of hospitality in our city that goes to the state of Louisiana. Uh, based, we really retain 1.5 percent. So there is a need for the city to retain an additional percentage what that looks like, we will determine through a collaborative process. In addition to um, looking at uh, even the homestead exemption, for example, I have a lot of people claiming that homestead exemption that are illegal. Um, we believe just on a preliminary uh, review, this could be about $8 million uh, that the city of New Orleans would be able to uh, retain um, based on reforms 
of homestead ex uh, exemption. And that would be within the assessor's scope of responsibility. So how would you go about causing that outcome in light of the fact that it's within his, um, his jurisdiction? It's been in the works for a long time now. Uh, I believe the uh, assessor, I have no reason to not believe mm -hmm. uh, the assessor would not want uh, these things to happen because ultimately it has an impact on the city of New Orleans in a positive manner. So back to the pavement management plan for streets, what's the amount of annual funding that you would commit? Well, based on assessments that have done, even BGR for that matter, um, up to 55 million has been floated. Um, and on an average, about 30 to 35 million. I know that you've taken a position, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you would eliminate traffic cameras except for in school zones. Um, no. No. Okay, so tell me no, your, your position I am on traffic cameras. I'm in favor of removing the traffic cameras. Um, I conducted and led a transportation working group uh, for. Um, the city of New Orleans through the, the um, city council. Um, that was after Shaw Wilson was killed, our little six-year-old uh, trying to cross Paris Avenue to get to the bus stop. Mm -hmm. um, not one recommendation that came out of that working group was we needed to install traffic cameras around schools. Mm -hmm. Now they did say on buses, not, on, not around schools. Um, they did say we need safe routes to schools. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so as a result of that, I wrote a grant uh, to the state for safe routes to schools, was able uh, to get the grant approved at 500000 Again, improving the conditions around schools to make it safe for our children. But what about the revenues that's produced from that? $16 million. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, we can um, reallocate and reassess uh, revenues that are currently in place within the budget. But I think the ad burden, when you think of the cost-benefit analysis, we can find other ways uh, and plug those holes uh, if, in fact, there will be holes. I'm not con convinced there would be. BGR identified a number of um, street-related revenues um, that are not currently spent on streets, so they're spent on other purposes. And I'm curious to know whether you think any of those street-related revenues should be um, sort of directed intentionally toward street preventive maintenance. A reassessment and reallocating or realigning those resources are, could possibly be low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say a thorough assessment in-house would need to be made. We need to do something different. Change has to occur, so I'm open to it for sure. You've talked about a new governance framework and organizational structure for the Sewage and Water Board. How realistic is it and how would you achieve accountability? We need to work with the appointing authorities to ensure that they are appointing and recommending individuals with skill sets and core competencies that are aligned with uh, the work of the Sewage and Water Board. And that rests with, with the mayor um, in terms of having effective leadership in place. So it really speaks to management and leadership uh, across the board with Sewage and Water Board. Getting, getting individuals, again, engineers who understand the work, who understand drainage, who understand stormwater management practices. We have heard in several different um, forums the suggestion that Sewage and Water Board should be folded into City Hall mm -hmm. um, and become a city department rather than an independent agency. What is your position specifically on that? Well, I, I think that, that it makes good sense. Mm -hmm. um, either it's folded in or if not, we have effective interagency collaboration and communication. Mm -hmm. Based on the existing conditions, we have to act now. And that means the first thing has to be improving the coordination and collaboration between Sewage and Water Board and the Department of Public Works. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion of the, um, the dual role that we recently experienced with the Department of Public Works and the Sewage and Water Board being led by the same individual? Well, I would say handle it differently. I would be the president. I mean, as mayor, that's the current structure. Being very much engaged, being at the table, but I'm not an engineer. So making sure that we have someone in place who is and who has those skill sets and knows what effective management and leadership looks like on the ground that yields results will be the priority. If that comes in one individual, then it does. I don't believe it does. Your infrastructure fund, can you explain the mechanics of it? What are the features that that fund would have within the context of revenues? Much like we did um, after Katrina when we, Women of the Storm, pushed 
for a coastal restoration fund is much of what I have in mind for creating this fund locally, giving our state delegation the um, reassurances needed uh, that if in fact the New Orleans receives an additional portion of its tax dollars or greater flexibility that resources from it would go into an infrastructure fund so that there is no question about where the money is going. Infrastructure. And we have a lot of need there, both we just talked about. Sewer, water, drainage, streets, uh, catch basins. I think all of these will be tied to that infrastructure fund. On professional services contracting, would you retain the centralized procurement office and the professional procurement officer? At this time, absolutely. I think that it has advanced um, uh, transparency and accountability within city government, which has to be a priority. Um, so yes, I would, I would keep those things in place and build on them where, where necessary. With regard to the composition of the selection committees that are convened right now, would you change the composition in any way? The composition is fine. It's just the, the people who are at the table. I think the people there matter. You've mentioned here today, you mentioned in your written responses that any changes to tax dedication should be discussed and negotiated with enti entities that currently benefit from these tax dedications. Um, mm -hmm, absolutely. I'm curious to understand sort of how you think, how and why, mm -hmm. that could be a successful endeavor because that's a difficult um, proposition in terms of talking with the beneficiaries of the taxes um, in furtherance of the potential that they may have to um, acknowledge a different or more critical need. So, so why do you think you can get us there? Uh, one, because we have to do some things differently in our city if we are wanting to um, have the quality of life that we say we want. You know, if we want to grow to survive, uh, if we want all of our folks to feel connected to growth and opportunity in our city, if we want to be safe uh, during a, a, um, a rainstorm, um, if we want public safety, real public safety outcomes, uh, the challenges that face our city are real, and it will require, it will require a change. And I don't see us getting there without talking to individuals who would be required to participate and be a part of that change. And that's what all the stakeholders, which include the hospitality industry, the business community, of course, residents, of course, you know, the, the, um, the local delegation, um, the city council. I mean, it has to be a collaborative effort. Um, and we have to have real conversations about um, these issues that we say are important. If hospitality uh, is so important and we want to grow our visitors from, from 10.5 million a year to 13 million, uh, but yet we say, you know, we need to make sure that our city is safer and flooding doesn't occur. Well, then it means that we're going to have to do something differently to plug the gaps that we have. And it will take us, one, coming to the table. That's the best way to get outcomes. You have to communicate. You have to build consensus. You have to listen. That's my background. That's, that's you know, what I've been able to do to get things done. So that's why I believe that I can do it because I've done it. As mayor, would you lead a state level effort to um, get passed by the legislature a narrowing of the nonprofit property tax exemption consistent with the template that we, we BGR, put forth? Um, I would, uh, not necessarily everything that you put forth. I think that I would consider that. Um, you all do great work. Um, so you, a stakeholder, building in your voice in that process? Absolutely but with others as well. And that does mean working with our state delegation, working again with all the stakeholders that I mentioned before, even the nonprofit community have to be at the table, not in isolation. So with that, I think that we will get to a, to, to a win-win scenario. That's how I work. That's what I strive for every step of the way. Don't believe in zero-sum game. That culture of win-lose has gotten us nowhere in this city to the point we're still a tale of two cities. So everyone has to feel like they're getting something. So the nonprofit community cannot feel like they're being bullied. They cannot feel like the burden is all on them. 
especially without having a real understanding of what the nonprofit community has meant to the city of New Orleans. It led this city in recovery. When we were waiting on government, the nonprofit community was working. And I was a part of that. All right, so that concludes my questions for you today. Thank you tremendously for participating in our candidate Q&A exercise. Thank you. So I would like to add that as a nonpartisan organization, we don't endorse candidates, so these discussions are just in furtherance of um, educating the public about the issues that are critical um, in this election. And the, these interviews, along with the Q&A reports and some additional ballot reports for the November 18th election will be featured on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.